Coming up on Digital Music Trends 174, recorded live at South by Southwest 2014, Spotify acquires the Econest, Neil Young launches the Pono as a Kickstarter, and Samsung launches Milk. Plus, at the end of the show, the interviews are recorded with Sachin Doshi from Spotify and Kevin Arnold, founder of Open Aura. This week's show is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com. And by MusicGraph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or developer.musicgraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And today it's a bit of a special show, we're recording live from South by Southwest uh, uh, here in Austin, Texas. And it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome Jim Carroll from the Irish Times. So hi Jim, how's it going? Very good, Andrea. Good to see you as well. And Brian Zisk from Massive Music Tech. Uh, how's it going, Jim? Uh, Brian? It's going great, and it's especially nice to meet you in person after yeah. all these videos. <laughs> I know, that's true. And uh, Kevin Browner uh, from uh, CD Baby. So hi Kevin, thanks for joining me. How's it going? How's it going? All good. So feel free to grab the mic. We have two mics here, so uh, we're going to try and, and work with that. And, uh, uh, you know, today we're going to just look at the headlines. We only have about a half hour to record the show, so uh, we're going to try and get through all the main news of the day. And at the end of the show, I'm, I'm going to add a, f a couple of the interviews I recorded uh, in the last few days. Uh, uh, I've got Spotify. I've got a new company called Open Aura, uh, created by the founder of, uh, uh, of uh, IOTA. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that, that should, be, this should be a pretty good show. But the headlines are actually plentiful this week. So first of all, we're going to talk about the Econest. So uh, the Econest has been acquired by uh, Spotify. Uh, it was announced uh, just uh, a few days ago and it's caused quite a, quite a few ripples here at South by Southwest. A lot of interest in the company. I know that uh, Paul Amir's panel yesterday was packed. I couldn't even get in. I was five minutes late. So uh, uh, great stuff over there. So uh, that comes close on the heels of uh, Spotify's acquisition of, uh, uh, sorry, of, uh, uh, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> we're going to get sound checks now, but it's fine. It's fine. The mics are really directional. So it's not, it's not a real problem. Uh, it comes close on the heels of uh, uh, um, the acquisition uh, by Beats of Topspin. Yes. And so, you know, two big acquisitions coming uh, one after the other. Uh, the Aconest uh, uh, said that their API is going to remain open uh, for the foreseeable future. And, uh, uh, but we're starting to see some ripples in the industry as, uh, for example, the CEO of RDO last night announced that they wouldn't uh, 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 stay with uh, the Aconest and they would move on and find another service provider. So, uh, you know, what are your impressions of this acquisition, first of all, and what do you think think the, the consequences are for the, for the industry as a whole. Well, I mean, if you if you if you've been keeping an eye on Econes, I suppose over the last couple of years, it's been a very they've been a very innovative company. What they've been doing is really interesting. What's like I mean, the the per, the, per, the per, sorry the per, the purchase the purchase by Spotify. It's like you know, they, it's it's like it's mo it's monopoly money in a way. I mean, it's also kind of like I suppose fu money as well. You know, I mean they like they know that what Econes has got is really really valuable valuable, and everything else is going to be after that for for the foreseeable future. They also know as well that like I, I could be wrong here, but like they also know as well that by taking control of Econes, it means that an awful lot of competitors will. Will basically go. Will, will basically stop using Econes API. They, they, they will. Econes may well claim the API is open, but like everyone's kind of go. We're not going to work with our competitors. You know. Also, I think what we're seeing here as well is we're seeing, I suppose, the the increasing, I suppose, uh, micro micro microization of the streaming market. You know. Like I mean, it is really is. It really is coming into to, to a number of very big players, and that's it. We've talked about this many times on, on the show, Andrea, before about the fact that do we need all these different streaming services? What what why are all these kind of Me Too streaming services popping up? Well, I mean, Spotify have this big war chest, so they're obviously going out, kind of, we're going buying the valuable stuff that's out there at the moment. Yeah. Brian? I'm very happy for my friends at Echo Nest. I hope Spotify has a great IPO and they all make lots of money. Um, <clears throat> for the ecosystem, it is a very interesting situation. I mean, when you start building on other people's APIs, you really are a little bit at their mercy. I mean, we had that issue when we were using the Twitter API and the price would go up 100x and, you know, they couldn't tell us it wasn't going to go up 100x again. So, um, you know, it, Echo Nest has really facilitated the ecosystem, though. There are so many of these streaming systems that uh, popped up as almost like a, a hack day uh, project. And it was really interesting because you could build personalized radio. And with the, the whole Pandora IPO frenzy, everybody really wanted to be a part of it. And uh, Echonest provided that part of the ecosystem. Now, of course, they're going to continue supporting people as long as the uh, contracts run. Uh, but according to the Echonest FAQ, uh, 
they're just thrilled about everything and they will continue to love and support their partners. I think you guys said it all. I don't have any further comments. <laughs> On your front, what do you think you know, is, coming, is coming next? Can, can you imagine other data companies like Last.fm, for example, that has been with CBS for years, but they're not really doing much with it. Can you imagine them doing something uh, and somebody actually being interested in acquiring them after this? Yeah, I mean, the, to me, the, when I saw the Echo Nest purchase, it was, it was uh, really more... I thought it was more of like Spotify trying to add more of a discovery engine that trying to compete with what Beats has uh, tried to make a big uh, point about being able to discover music easier in their in their uh, system. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that there's a lot of people uh, like uh, Last.fm. People still use it a lot, and uh, it's a, a nice. Um, kind of aggregator of data that's still sitting out there. I'm sure someone will pick it up soon. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, uh, the other thing that happened this week uh, was uh, Pono. So yesterday I saw Neil Young's uh, 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 keynote. It was kind of a keynote, kind of a, an interview. It was uh, both. I think half of it was a, a speech and half of it was an interview. So uh, he launched this project. I've been, to be honest, I've been a major doubter of Pono so far, uh, but I was really interested in the fact that they launched a Kickstarter campaign and it's already raised $1.3 million uh, as of this morning on the 800 grand that it had as a minimum so it's already gone past that although 800 grand I don't think it would be enough to create a hardware device but uh, you know <laughs> uh, but it, so you know an interesting take here I mean uh, Pono is gonna support uh, it's both a hardware device and a, a platform where they're gonna sell music from it's gonna support all sorts of bit rates from uh, you know the lowest to the highest uh, you know 192 kilohertz I think uh, which is uh, insane but uh, you know Neil Young said that he can hear the difference and if uh, you if a six-year-old that has been playing loud music for <laughs> forever can hear the difference, then I'm, um, you know, it's, it's something. And they had a bunch of interviews from the likes of, you know, Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, Flea from Royal Chili Peppers. Neil's mates. Neil's mates. Yeah. Exactly. A bunch of people that all talked about uh, how great they sounded and everything else. So, I don't know. I, I kind of like, I, I can imagine there being a niche market here for people that want this. And there's 4,000 backers now. But, you know, 4,000 or 40,000 or 50,000 backers at the end of the campaign, are, are they enough to support an ecosystem based on high quality audio? Uh, Kevin, I don't know, uh, you have experience in this, in this field as uh, well, so you want to take I, that? Yeah, I'm, I'm very skeptical as well. You can hear the difference. I mean, I haven't heard their particular product, but when you're comparing like a WAV file to an MP3, there is a drastic difference in audio quality. Whether or not the average consumer cares, I would say they probably don't. I mean, more and more people are using streaming services, which sound even worse than an MP3. And so the industry is kind of going the opposite direction. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's got to take massive adoption in order for it to them to be able to afford to keep making them and iterating. Otherwise, it's just going to be a, uh, you know, a mini disc player that which I still have one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the, the mini disc players are still very, very good. They still work. I still have a Xavier recorder that still works as well. All these things still work, you know. But today, it's, 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 it comes down to a mass audience. Will the mass audience go for it? I mean, you would you said they're very good. The interesting thing you said about the, the niche audience. There's definitely a niche audience out there of both Neil Young fans and Heritage Rock fans who will go with something like this. But is there, is there enough of them to go for it? I don't know. I mean, you mentioned numbers like 4,000, 40,000. Maybe he's only some. Maybe he'll kind of like maybe he'll uh, get, come up with a shortfall himself from his own bank account, you know. But like it's interesting. I, I, I spoke to someone who's even a bigger skeptic than probably the four of us put together yesterday, and he was at the uh, the showcase yesterday, and he was really curious afterwards. And this is something. This is someone like who's who was going in just to kind of like poo poo the whole idea. He was he was well nobody he, 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 like, like like you like like skeptic. skeptic. Yeah. But he, he came out and he was kind of not converted but very very curious. And like if there's if there's people like that out there who kind of going like they they want more than streaming, they want better quality than streaming, they want something else, and they're Neil Young fans, they're Heritage Rock fans, there could be an audience. I mean, there is a, there's a device back in the UK, I think it's called Bannon, that Bannon CD player, for example, that's got a market, you know, there are markets out there, but it'll be niche, not, not mass. Yeah. Well, I'm a huge Neil Young fan, and uh, I think I'm going to come down, I don't want to be contrarian, but slightly more optimistic than my esteemed colleagues here. <laughs> so here's the story. There is a difference. And that's what I think the key point is, is that Neil wants there to be better quality music. I think he feels that, you know, I mean... 14 songs 20 years ago, there's 14 songs now. They're, you know, they're, it's not like the value of 14 songs now is that much greater. You know, there's more competition, but people can, you know, I don't need to be in the room with my disc and the player. I have it all on my phone or streaming anywhere. So 
I don't think it's that Neil is interested in really doing hardware, and I think that's what the Kickstarter sort of showed. It's not like, I'm going out there, I'm going to create a Sonos, I'm going to create a Beats by Dre. It's not one of those plays. I think it's very much that he really wants people to appreciate that the higher quality music, uh, music files, is a higher quality experience, and if you want to make a change, you've got to go out there and do it yourself. So it's not like this is a misdirection, but I really kind of think those triangular shaped players, they'll be great collector's items, it'll be wonderful be for people who want to support Neil directly, but what all of a sudden people are starting to say, oh, CDs, you know, there were a few people who say, oh, vinyl's better than CDs, but now I think people will really see that there are better formats and stronger formats, and my belief is he's going to come out with these, but the real aim is to build an ecosystem where you can have the higher quality files and have a more enjoyable music experience. I mean, and the yeah. one final thing there is, in case he pulls it off and people start doing what they did when they replaced their vinyl with CDs, if all of a sudden you can get people to buy the collection again uh, in a higher res format, yeah. that would be great. That part I'm skeptical on, yeah. but in reality, <laughs> I think it's yeah. a great move for him to really raise the profile of higher quality formats. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like a matter of well, figuring out whether it's sustainable as a service because if somebody's willing to drop $400 on a device, they might also be willing to drop, you know, three or $400 a year on music. So maybe... And I, don't know. and I would add, I would add to the conversation. I'm all for it too. I, I want the higher quality as well because that's one thing that annoys me and why I don't use. I, I use Spotify and, and Pandora a bit, but it's like the I want a better listening experience and and I'm willing I'm willing to buy it if if it's a, a good quality item. Um, but uh, I just don't know if if the average listener knows that that's a need and that's that's yeah. what why I think I don't. I don't, I, I don't know if it'll fly in the long run, but I hope it does. And that's a hard part because, you know, you're getting pre better and better quality with the streaming services all the time. And if I can get my entire family unlimited music on Beats, you know, for 200, under $200 a year, it's going to be hard for, to convince us to buy 20 CDs. Um, you know, especially if eventually these higher quality files make their ways onto all the streaming services. The days of buying, you know, physical product or downloads to go to tie to physical product may be over. Yeah, I, th I think as well. It's what she said as well about like you know what that what that number is out there. I mean, if you look at young, if you look at younger music fans, do they care about the music quality? They care about if they're really into their music and they start making music themselves and they begin to appreciate the difference. But most of them have just got used to like you mean like crappy YouTube files. You know, they have that has become that's become the standard for them. Sadly. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, going from uh, high quality audio to uh, a totally different type of experience. So we've seen Samsung come out with yet another attempt to uh, conquer the music market this uh, this week with uh, Milk. We've seen a Milk uh, uh, van outside uh, on, uh, I think it was Friday, and everybody went, oh, what is this? What is this? It's a new Samsung music service for the US, uh, which is uh, based essentially on Slacker. It does provide a different UI, and I've heard from a couple of people that it's actually quite, quite an interesting UI, but uh, it is essentially Slacker music. Music. It is free to access. Locked down to Samsung Galaxy owners on the Android App Store for now. So, uh, very interesting play for Samsung here, and uh, their maybe third or fourth attempt to, to get into the music market properly. So, well, why do manufacturers keep trying to get into this game? And is it you know is it just like a Samsung versus Apple thing? Or, or well, I it? mean, th for me, it actually I believe it makes a lot of sense because when you have a phone. Is it a phone or is it a phone and a music device? And if you're going to be selling, you know, it's like people don't know. It's like, I don't want to get an iPhone, I'll get a Samsung, I'll get a this, I'll get a that. What comes with it? Oh, unlimited music? It's a real feature. And whereas it's hard to sell music, these days, you know, it's very easy to use music to help sales of other products. So if you all of a sudden, if people choose to buy a Samsung device because of milk, I mean, how much do the manufacturers make per phone? It's like a couple hundred per phone and then they share in the contract and you're talking about a four or $5,000 commitment over a few years. That's with family plan on limited date, I get that. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, if it helps sell some more of those, it's really worthwhile and that's something that's important important is how do you take the visceral response to music that people have and have it help 
drive much larger transactions. If you sell, you know, a one dollar song or a fifteen dollar a month subscription, it's one thing. If you help, it, if it helps you sell a sixty thousand dollar Lexus, that really helps uh, send more value to the creators of music and yeah. in various ways of compensation. And we've seen actually the iTunes Radio yesterday. I've seen a, a, a survey saying that it's become the third biggest. Uh, uh, streaming service. Uh, uh, I saw Spotify. that too, I but what, what does that mean? Is like, yeah. does that mean yeah. people accidentally click on iTunes radio <laughs> as they're scrolling through <laughs> it? I, I don't know what to <laughs> numbers, number, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You see, it's like is it that, that's. I think that size says it all. I mean, you know, like you know, you 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 probably you could probably write a great book right now, Andrea, about all these different plays over the years and how successful, not successful they've been. <laughs> what it comes down to, like, I mean, is for the for the mass for, for the for, it's a, again, it's mass it's it's mass market, it's little market. Mass market is kind of like it's YouTube, Spotify, Beats. Little market is everything else. Samsung, you, you're right, you're totally right there about the, what, why Samsung would get involved with in something like this. But you said a very interesting thing. You kind of said about like what music driving kind of like the, the sale of a sixty thousand. Sixty thousand dollar Lexus, for example. I'm kind of going like, okay, that, that's a that's a that's a huge kind of some money kind of going to the garage owner and going to Lexus. Where is that money checking down to the music to the music maker then as well? I mean, I, I, this is a very odd thing for me to be kind of saying because normally I kind of normally I'm kind of arguing the other way around. But I often kind of wonder with, with all these plays that are going on, do, like, I mean, is it really bringing more value to music? Is it really bringing more profile to music, or is it really like I mean, just taking all that kind of oxygen away and giving it solely to the device maker? In this case, Samsung. I mean. <coughs> My, my thought is that uh, it actually, uh, with the Cricket Wireless system and their Move Music, it actually, they actually did get some pretty good traction from that. And, um, you know, we, we saw some decent payments going to artists that were, they're getting their music on there. But it is a play for the, the manufacturer. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're trying to sell devices. I mean, that's what Apple's trying to do with, with the iTunes store is sell devices. So um, whether or not it'll stick, I don't know. But uh, I know Samsung yeah. is, is desperately trying to, to take down the iPhone, and, and they've been making some good strides. So. And are you surprised to see Slacker being part of the play in this, in this case? Uh, well, I mean, Slacker's a good product, so it's not surprising at all, actually. Yeah. I mean, what, what's really interesting with things like, like you know, Move and, and, and iTunes, there were all these huge mar music markets that popped up because the music industry felt that they were really insignificant markets. You know, Apple has a 5% market share. Oh, sure, we'll give them, let them try this. It can't really mess with our market, you know, or move, which is really towards the low-income consumer who never really spends money on music. So the incremental revenue there is really valuable, and it's really uh, informative that it turns out to be these initially fringe systems that kind of are allowed to sneak through because they're not going to disrupt everything that really end up driving so much uh, so much stuff. And my final comment on that is that it will be really interesting when uh, AT&T ditches move and switches over their two million customers over to Beats. I have no inside information. I know nothing, but <laughs> can't wait to see it happen. <laughs> That's interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we also saw that uh, Beats uh, raised, uh, apparently raised $60 million last night. I haven't really read in depth the articles because I was uh, half asleep when I saw the news. So I'm not really sure exactly what the details are on that and if there are any details. But, but again, another big fundraise for Beats that had uh, already raised uh, qu quite a bit of money last year. So, yeah, we're going to, you know, they must have spent a lot of the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, how do you feel about Beats? I, li I think Beats is my favorite service now. I mean, I apologize to my really? friends at Spotify wow. and all that. But as of now, I, I think Beats is great. I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's, I, got, I it's, got, it. I, it's yeah, got a long UK. way to come, but it's really to, to launch with something that is better than the best is a really good start and they're almost sucking the air out of the out of the technical and, and employee market in the music tech space every time I turn around it's like this great friend is leaving from Apple over there this great friend is leaving you know they're really hiring uh, and with this extra money you know they're gonna be like the Google of the space it's gonna be very hard to compete with them for talent yeah but, uh, the other things so at the same time beats has still got quite a, a road ahead when it comes to platform integration like Spotify now appears to be the platform of choice when it comes to developers integrating that in their own apps. But I believe but today Beats is actually launching their API. Exactly. Literally so. today, as is Open Aura. Yeah, so we're going to have to see what happens in that space. Uh, you know, do, do you think Beats uh, needs to raise more money? or? <laughs> I, I have not uh, used it personally. I've used it on other people's phones, just yeah. checking it out. 
the, my my thing with them is uh, I'm just curious since they don't have a free option that you can try it free for seven days, if that's going to inhibit massive growth. I mean, they've got a big buzz right now, and uh, clearly they're spending some money and have a cool look and great campaign, which I knew they would, being tied to the Beats brand. But uh, so I'm just curious to see how how where they're at in six months and a year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jim, do you want to see that? Do you, you want to see Beats in Ireland? Absolutely, absolutely. I just want to try. Just want to try it out. But like, it's, it's really, it's really curious to, as you as you started off by saying that they raised sixty million last night. I mean, are they burning through this money really, really fast? Is it all been spent on hires? What else has been spent on? You know, I mean, it's it's interesting that they're coming in. They're coming in at that at that kind of level. As with Spotify, as as with Spotify when they launch as well, the amount of money involved is ginormous. You know. Well, I mean, they're really smart, and they know their numbers, and we don't. Um, and the fact that so many people like uh, like me, you know, my whole family's on the three-month free AT&T plan, and then the question is who's going to cancel it and who's not. And we're going to keep playing. And it's interesting because by being on AT&T, I believe when the three months end, you just automatically get billed to your account. It's not like one of those three months free and then put in your credit card. It's like if you don't cancel it, it's there. So my belief is a lot of these folks right. are going to convert. And I honestly, it's very interesting because everybody I know, except for me, says that the free model where you give, you let people have stuff for free and then you upsell them, you know, well, it's bad that Beats doesn't do it. But in reality, that model hasn't been working so well. Yeah. And since you end up having, you know, I don't know what it is, 90 plus percent of the people not paying, could be 97 percent, I don't know, you have the pay people subsidizing the free people. Yeah. And in the beat situation, especially since they get the consumer marketing and how to, how to bring people in, I don't think the lack of a freemium uh, pro of a free product yeah. will hurt them at all. Except among people who don't want to spend any money, who will just take for free everywhere. Well, I mean that was a good point because the, you know the one thing that they've said is that they're going to be, uh, you know, pay out artists better and and more uniform across the board, not make secret backroom deals with the major labels, then then screw the other folks. Yeah. Which you know I'm I'm happy to see, and I hope they stay true to that. And you're right when they don't have to subsidize a bunch of freebies you know, carry a bunch of dead weight, they're probably more able to do that. And Jim, I wanted to finish by asking you about this acquisition that happened last week. Balcony TV was acquired by The Orchard. So Balcony, uh, Balcony TV was acquired by The Orchard. Uh, it's Who was acquired by uh, The Orchard? Balcony TV. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a Dublin-based startup who basically like I mean, took balconies like like here in someone's apartment and basically did shows on them, and it it, 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 it spread from city to city. Very very clever project, project fair place to fair place to team. So it, 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 they, they have been it has been a very very good play. They didn't they went through an accelerator program in Dublin. They have expanded quite a lot. I mean, you know, it's again it's a very clever idea. I love these clever ideas that have come along in the media space over the last while. I mean, these like be it like having concerts on a bandstand in London, concerts in the back of a black cab. These kind of ideas are just taking it's 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 it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of clever innovative use of video as well that's getting away from like I mean very very hackneyed ideas like as well for the bands as well involved it's, it's much much better for them to actually go to someone's someone's apartment and play in a balcony than do something normally very very clever idea but also kind of what makes you wonder as well I suppose we're right now we're getting to the kind of me too factor who's next what will be the next balcony TV out there and will they be acquired and who will acquire them yeah well, I have not heard about the acquisition, but it doesn't mean I won't comment it on, any, on it anyway. I think it's probably a great thing because The Orchard is moving into other areas, away from just music, but into as well film and video and all of that. So if all of a sudden they can uh, obtain the content creators and become you know, more integrated, I think it's a good move for The Orchard. They got a bunch of great folks over there. Yeah, I missed the name of the company because of the Balcony TV. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. It, what what is, I'm not familiar with balcony TV. Balcony TV, they, they shoot videos of bands on balconies, but they have about 40 cities. No, it's, it's the name, balcony 40 TV. 40 or 50 <laughs> cities where they record these videos, and uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been going on for a few years actually. I think five, years, five, Couple, six, years. five six years, yeah, exactly. Hmm. So so yeah, it's an interesting acquisition, like just as a as a, a network of people that are able to shoot bands wherever they end up being. I guess. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's I'm, a I'm funny sure one. that they're probably finding you know the 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 whole video content ID and curating that kind of content is becoming huge and so to me if, if something like that's working and yeah. you're getting value off of you know monetizing on YouTube I'm sure that it's got a good future yeah awesome well Jim I know I have to let you go but yeah. uh, I'm just gonna finish up with these guys and uh, uh, thanks so much for your time
Uh, well, thanks guys so much for uh, joining me today on the podcast and uh, and Kevin uh, anything you want to plug you've got a great podcast as well so uh, make sure you let people know about that yeah I mean uh, at CD baby we have a, we have the blog is more active the DIY musician blog which has got lots right. of great content the podcast that I do the DIY musician podcast is is uh, has some amazing interviews with artists and other industry people and and uh, it's been on a little bit of a hiatus just because it's been a challenge to keep up with it but <laughs> but there's uh, 130 episodes of, of content that is uh, that I go back still and listen to with people anyone from like uh, Jack Conte from uh, uh, Pamplemousse or uh, Pamplemousse yeah uh, to uh, you know people like Seth Godin and stuff just lots of great great advice to artists so yes yeah, right. we're checking out it's awesome. in the iTunes it's, uh, store and and all the all the, uh, the the blog is on cdbaby.com yeah it's uh, yeah if you search the CD baby blog you'll find it so okay perfect and uh, and Brian of course SF music tech uh, coming up uh, what one is happening we got the SF music tech summit it's coming up on May 20th in San Francisco sfmusictech.com I hope you come on by I also want to plug a bunch of the companies I'm involved in this is uh, Boombotics wireless portable speaker two ways you can Cute. do speakerphone you can do Siri they're really pretty pretty indestructible <laughs> oh no it did break apart oh, I could put the front back on no problem <laughs> but uh, yeah so all sorts of fun stuff less than three great player <laughs> check them on out there's all sorts of great stuff That's hope awesome. to see you in San Francisco in May well guys thanks so much and thanks for listening to the DMT podcast we're going to have a couple of interviews after this uh, with uh, Spotify Open Aura and maybe a couple of others if I get the time to edit them and put them on uh, so uh, stay tuned for more coverage of uh, South by Southwest on the on sxsw.digitalmusictrans.com or also so check out the show and all the videos on YouTube. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until next time. This is a Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014. And uh, I'm here with uh, Sachin Doshi from uh, Spotify. So hi, Sachin. Thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi, nice to meet you. And uh, Sachi is the uh, Spotify Head of Development and Analysis, and we're just here in front of the Spotify house. We can see that there's a crazy line here. So yeah. <laughs> It's going great this year. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, first of all, I want to talk about Spotify's audience. Uh, and uh, you recently uh, announced uh, the opening up of the platform uh, to, uh, for free to mobile users uh, in a sort of limited way, mm -hmm. and also uh, giving a comparable experience uh, as desktop for tablet users as well. So how has that inf affected, uh, you know, the, the audience that you have? Have you seen a spike uh, in usage? Uh, and then how how's that worked yeah so um, you know we've been noticing for a long time before we launched the product that um, consumers music listeners had been abandoning their desktop they were joining Spotify or downloading Spotify directly on their mobile or their tablet um, never using their desktop to listen to music um, as the smartphone penetrations gotten um, much greater and we realized that for our freemium model to continue to uh, effectively grow the paid subscriber base we needed to have some kind of free mobile option yeah. but of course at the same time maintaining some amount of uh, functionality for premium users only um, so we released the product in December that was um, a limited as you say somewhat limited free mobile product uh, on smartphones and um, bringing our desktop free on-demand product to tablets and what's happened basically is we have um, seen more and more users uh, stay yeah. and continue to use the service where before this the moment they were asked to put their credit card in they left or uh, most of them left some of them would subscribe what we're seeing now is we're retaining many more of those users they continue awesome. to use the service and then over time they will convert to our paid tier uh, whereas before we just lose them all together that's great and yeah. talking about conversion to the paid tier so we're seeing an increasing number of amazing apps that are integrating the Spotify API out there yep. and uh, and of course those are limited at the moment to the premium subscribers so do you see that as a real driver for premium subscriptions for the company yeah I mean I think as as that ecosystem continues to grow we expect that it will help us continue to convert uh, users to paying and honestly we want to make sure that people who are willing to pay 10 pounds 10 euros 10 dollars a month are able to listen to music everywhere that they might uh, interact or experience music. sure absolutely and looking at uh, the uh, back end side of things we just released the beta of the uh, mobile SDK for iOS yep. so that's gonna make it easier than ever for third-party developers to integrate uh, Spotify within their own apps yes. so uh, you know uh, what kind of uh, usage are you thinking are you thinking of uh, here <laughs> it could be anything honestly it's it's anywhere that you would kind of experience music whether that's just listening having some type of interactions um, it uh, it could be a, a, there's a, like a history of music app or yeah. Uh, or as um, there, we just released, uh, or a company just released an app called Pacemaker, which is yeah. a DJ app, which allows you to um, to basically use Spotify streams as the source for your uh, for your DJ performances. I mean, there's. Um 
there's a lot of different ways that you can imagine integrating music uh, yeah. into an app and, and we want to support all of it. Yeah, sure. And looking at the ecosystem, of course, uh, uh, you started out in the app space with, the, with your own apps on the desk appliance. Yep. So uh, how, how are you planning to move that forward? Um, it's unclear. I mean, that's been a very successful for us, yeah. uh, you know, especially for our power users who really engage with those apps quite a bit. Um, we have to, you know, we're continuing to evolve that platform so that it's better integrated into the overall Spotify experience. Sure. Uh, and as you said, build better tools for people to uh, integrate Spotify into their own apps and their own uh, sites. Yeah, absolutely. And looking at the uh, latest news of this week, uh, of course, the acquisition of the Aconest was a was a really big deal because mm -hmm. I've known those guys for forever, and uh, you know, it's yeah. a, it's a great acquisition. So yeah. uh, from from your front, from you know. So the analytics and development front, what, what is exciting you about this? You know, we've we've been working with the Echo Nest for a long time as well. Yeah. I think you know, for years we've recognized um, the great work that they've done um, in machine listening and in understanding uh, trends on the web and yeah. and really developing uh, probably the the strongest data set around how people were consuming music outside of a, an actual digital serv a streaming service or a download service. Um, we you know we think they're a natural fit for Spotify in helping us improve and continue to get better at. Um, D music discovery on Spotify. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we talked a lot about you know uh, apps uh, uh, that are using the Spotify API, mm -hmm. but Spotify also uses uh, uh, APIs from other companies to improve uh, to improve your service. For example, Songcake is now uh, fairly well integrated within yep. the desktop client, and you have a lot of concert recommendations for uh, gigs happening nearby yep. artists that you're following. Uh, also, you now you've uh, you had an interesting partnership with Next Big Sound for the for the artists, uh, yep. um, uh, you know, data yep. that you know finally artists can get uh, a better look at what, who's listening to uh, what, where. Yep. Uh, through Spotify. So how, how are you seeing those partnerships evolve and, and what kind of benefits are they bringing to the company? I mean, Songkick started really uh, at first as an app partner on our yeah. desktop app. Uh, what we've done with both ticketing and merchandise uh, with Topspin and with other partners uh, is to um, allow users to very easily purchase tickets and merchandise from an artist yeah. um, on the su service. And the idea here is that we want to provide as many tools as possible for artists to engage their fans on Spotify and we're evolving that over time. Um, Next Big Sound was a, a somewhat different partnership. That is. Uh, that was really to give artists an understanding of how their content was being used on Spotify. Yeah. Um, you know, what kind of streaming volume they were seeing, um, who, what kind of demographics were listening to their audience. And the idea is to then, for them to be able to use that dashboard to better, underst better understand their business, uh, how Spotify is affecting their business, and also using Spotify as a better promotional tool, um, using the data to decide, you know, what kind of activities they might want to partake in, whether that's tour planning or you know, whether appearing on a late night talk show helps them spike uh, streams, all of these different things that the Next Big Sound dashboard um, allows artists to see. Um, we wanted to make sure that they could see Spotify's impact on their business through that. Yeah, sure. Looking at international uh, landscape, you know, Spotify is expanding into more and more countries all the time. Yep. So, uh, you know, uh, how are you finding uh, providing uh, uh, a great local catalog and support for that analysis and uh, and sort of uh, all the right tools for local people to understand uh, uh, and, and, and find the lo local like content as well? Yeah, so we are, um, you know, only over the last year have we really stretched outside of our sort of Western Europe, un United States kind yeah. of um, in, like sort of initial uh, launch territories. And what we're finding is that um, we're much more successful, obviously, when we spend the time to localize playlists, you know, help users, especially at the beginning. Ultimately, what we do all the time is to use the listening data to then power the discovery and to power what we uh, what we surface to our users. So very quickly after we launch, we're able to use our initial users listening to help um, to help new users discover new music. Um, at the beginning, we're just doing more work, kind of manually curating playlists. We have a browse feature. Um, I don't know if yeah. you've seen it, but um, our browse feature is one in which Spotify programs fantastic playlists, and we've been um, localizing all of those playlists so that when we launch in a in a country in Asia or in South America, you'll see um, heavily localized content in those playlists. Um, and our radios or our radio stations are more heavily localized. So everything so that when, a, especially for those first few months when users go into the service, immediately they know that that service is for them, yeah. not just for Europe and the US. That's awesome, actually. You know, the last thing I was going to end on was, uh, you know, it's been written in a few places that, you know, the fact that you acquired the Aconest uh, is, a, is a reinforcement of the fact that you're more uh, attached to the data side than into the, into the personal side of things. But, you know, the playlists are a really key factor for, for yeah. Spotify as well. Yeah, we've always, look, the data is an extremely important resource for us to be able to plan and to, to understand various parts of our business, whether that's product features or how, music, how people are listening to music. Um, but ultimately, especially in terms of how people connect with music, you have to be able to match that with some human element. We've right. never, we've never said otherwise. And, you know, we launched, um, 
we acquired Tunigo last year and then integrated yeah. them into our browse feature so that we did have that option uh, and we did have that feature for our users to be able to find uh, curated playlists. And the other thing is that Spotify has always been a platform for our users to, to power that as well. So yeah. any user can become a tastemaker on the service and become, you know, we have a follow platform so that, um, and you know, if I wanted to go on and, and discover new music, I could follow tastemakers on the service. That could be sure. you, that could be um, a celebrity, it could be anybody. And um, and we just use the power of our own fan, our own user base to be able to manually and human curation of music. That's fantastic. And finally, uh, what artists are you most excited about seeing at Spotify House this week? Uh, well, we just saw Jungle, who are fantastic. Awesome. Uh, Fanagram played yesterday. They're great. Um, St. Paul and the Broken Bones, for those of you who don't know, great retro wow. soul act. Um, it's a great lineup yeah. all week, and uh, we're really looking forward to enjoying the rest of it. That's great. Well, Sachin, thanks so much for your yeah, time. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. Uh, it's, uh, it's all on digitalmusictrans.com, so go and find it there. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and I'm here with uh, Kevin Arnold, the founder and CEO of Open Aura. So hi Kevin and thanks for joining me, how's it going? Uh, great, thanks, yeah, it's fun to be back in Austin. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, Open Aura is a new project that you have, so first of all tell us all about it, what is it? Um, essentially, Open is a platform that aggregates and syndicates or distributes content centered around artist identity. Essentially, uh, anything in digital form um, that represents who the artist is, trying to really focus on uh, moving beyond the traditional, uh, what we consider to be the 1980s version of artist identity, the bio and photo, into a, a much broader uh, and full comprehensive set of any information created by or about the artist. So essentially, the artist is allowed to then curate and manage all of this content, publish it out to the places where its fans are engaging with them, and during the process, make money from it. Yeah, and sure, and for people that don't know you, uh, your background is at IOTA, of course, uh, and so uh, did that inform the start of this company, and how did you get the, the idea for it? Yeah, it, it's interesting that I came to understand it eventually, um, actually just maybe a few months ago, how really similar it was to IOTA in a sense. And I've only just begun to speak about it as, a, as an aggregation platform. But um, yeah, it did come out of IOTA, I think, in, in a sense, uh, post the uh, merger with The Orchard in uh, spring of 2012. I spent uh, a year working with Sony Music on essentially some very high level problems around uh, the, the, that the industry is facing. Essentially, what can we do to create uh, more engaging fan experiences around music online to sort of yeah. evolve the music user experience and a goal of um, increasing subscriptions and more more uh, fan engagement online, and uh, it it came out of it came out of that work, and eventually was spun out into uh, into a new company. But it wasn't uh, until after we started thinking about it, it was really okay. It's an artist identity platform, or it's a, a platform for creating new types of fan experiences. Uh, aggregation wasn't the original goal, but it turns out that that was the secret to us to be able to uh, start building out the platform and, and bring all the content to life. So the way thing in which it's going to work, it's got a, it's got a big focus on APIs as well, yes. uh, the company. So how, how did that come about and how are you planning to integrate that in order to make money for the artists that are on the platform? Yeah, well, fundamentally, our, our product is APIs that um, publish indexes or, or information, pointers to content that the artist has curated that they feel best represents them. Yeah. So um, it's, it, it is really fundamental from a technology standpoint. We do a few different things. One is go out and, and try and identify and analyze all of the content that exists about an artist in open and, open and social content contexts. But um, a, a large part of the platform is also bringing what the artist owns and creates into the platform as well as what anybody else has created about the artist. So that essentially you've got the, the full set of content um, at the uh, artist's disposal to communicate better with the fan. Yeah, sure. And so, uh, well, tell me about the process. So, an artist wants to join uh, or, or Open Aura. How, how does it work? How, how do they get into it? Yeah, so, it's essential. It's it's as easy as going to our website, which is openaura.com, and you'll see a, a big search box right at the top there. What we want an artist to do is come in and search for themselves, and and discover what we've already done for them, which is create uh, what we call the default digital aura for the artist. So, we've already gone out and uh, hopefully identified all of an artist's social accounts, all of the open sources like Wikipedia, where information is. Yeah. And then we harvest and analyze all of that to create it, what we call a default aura. And then the artist comes in, claims the, their aura, logs in via Twitter or Facebook. And at that point, we've 
are trusting that if you can log into their social accounts that you are the artist and uh, then the artist is in control. Yeah, sure. And from, from a legal perspective, uh, uh, branding is a very interesting uh, uh, thing and, and it's different from country to country. I know that uh, you know, uh, lawyers in, in the UK may recommend different things to lawyers in the US when it comes sure. to actually acquiring uh, the ownership of your brand as a band or as an artist. So uh, in that sense, I guess uh, Openora may really come in handy to establishing yourself as your own brand uh, out there and be able to make a case for that as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, in a, in a sense, I think that it, and most artists do spend a lot of time curating and cultivating their brand. Um, the, the interesting thing about it is that it, it happens in a very fragmented and sort of chaotic way. There's content of different types, video, songs, information, images, and they're spread and published in many different places around the world. So while we, we think of this identity as, a, as um, a real sort of descriptive and fundamental part of who an artist is, it's actually quite spread out and fragmented around the world. One of the things that, that we do in getting started is just to come out and try and really understand after 10 or 20 years of internet and social content creation, who, who is this person as defined by all of this information about them? Yeah. And once you have that look and understand if you can go and you know any, any user can search for and browse any artist in the system, yeah. it's quite a different look of, of the artist, one that we feel actually is much more representative of who they truly are and what they're really doing. You know, this, this content that they're creating and, and interacting with every day is a, you know, it's a much more intimate view of the artist, we feel, than the uh, formal bio and photo. While yeah. still important, there's a lot, much, a lot more out there that uh, contributes to this identity. Yeah, and so uh, have you got any partnerships already in place? Uh, or otherwise, what would be your ideal uh, uh, partner for this venture? Yeah, so we look as far as customers or partners for the API, it's really anybody who's creating an, an application or an experience around music or an artist. Uh, essentially, we say any screen between an artist and a fan, which of course starts with music players and yeah. uh, DSPs and, and digital music stores, but also uh, ticketing websites, blogs, merchandising, any 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 place, magazines online, yeah. that you might read about or experience an artist's content. So we think very broadly in that sense. Yeah. Um, first customers for us, we're, uh, we're talking to dozens of companies out there and we're about to uh, just launch the public beta of our API. Great. And we aren't quite ready to talk about it, but sure. by the time the people might be seeing this, there uh, should be some news about uh, our first partners. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, what do you think about South by Southwest this year? And uh, uh, are you looking for partners here? And, and uh, you know, what is the general vibe for you? Yeah, it's it's exciting this year, and it's fun for me coming back after having you know been here for more than a decade. I think uh, over the course of IOTA and, and other endeavors, um, is it's great to be back with something new and with a new set of eyes, right? Being too busy, yeah, it is. It is, and you, you sort of see everything through a different lens. Our focus here is is yes with um, music services and other customer uh, customer um, potentials, but also uh, a lot of conversations with artist managers and labels, right? So the platform is is really meant to you know, it's been built from within the industry and yeah. in partnership with the industry. We obviously came from the label world and, and in my past, many, uh, you know, much experience and relationships with the independent label landscape, a super important part of the equation. Um, but also artist management are really at the core here. It's, it's the artist that uh, itself, you know, has, has the right in, in inherently to curate this identity and bring it to bear. Um, and so it's it's a great new landscape for me, meeting a lot of the, the great artist managers out there. I mean, I've I, I had a pretty good set of, of contacts and relationships, but it's a, a broad new world. So yeah, we've uh, got very full schedules as we try and uh, yeah. meet with as many people as we can to spread the word. And it's a good time to move into this space as well with this new angle as well. We're seeing acquisitions like that of the Econest last week. So Yeah, it's been a very exciting couple of weeks uh, yeah. or, or week, I guess, for um, for the space. And you know we're we're brand new, just entering. Um, you know, primarily, uh, you know, core for us at South by this year is the the music hackathon that they're hosting the first one of, and it's also the debut of our our uh, public beta API. And you know, we've been building this platform for a long time, and just very excited to uh, to get it into the hands of developers, uh, alongside some other great companies that will be participating, like Echo Nest and Grace Note and Spotify and others, uh, and see what people can build. Because That's great. So you're part of the hackathon. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yes, and um, you know, from that standpoint, uh, the API is unique in that there 
there aren't very many, well, there aren't any uh, open APIs that offer authentic artist information and content that the artist really wants you to see, along with all of this other social and information that's been posted about them. So we're really excited to see what people will build. That's fantastic. And so uh, can you give us a website for, for developers or people that are interested in the product? Yes, yeah. Uh, the website's www.openor.com, and uh, the developer site will uh, be up and available at developers.openor.com uh, starting Wednesday, I believe. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com. Thank you.